uh, for those who don't know, my name is Bernard Harris. Um, I work here in the School of Social Work and Social Policy. Um, and it's my pleasure today to introduce Ellen Stewart, um, who is going to talk about fugitive co-production community practices in Scottish hospitals and why they matter. So Ellen is um, currently um, a Chancellor's Fellow in the Centre for Biomedicine, Self and Society at the University of Edinburgh's Medical School. And she previously worked at the Global Public Health Unit at the University of Edinburgh and at the Medical School at St Andrews. Um, but she'll be joining us in five days time. Um, so this just about qualifies as an external presentation, but um, it will shortly become an internal presentation, which is great for us. Um, so Ellen has degrees in politics and in social policy and planning, and she's an elected member of the executive committee of the UK Social Policy Asso uh, Association. And she teaches in the areas of health policy, public services, and qualitative research methods. She's currently working on two research grants. One is a UK Prevention Research Partnership Consortium on Systems Science for Public Health, which for obvious reasons is better known as CIFR. Um, and she's doing that with a, a kind of large host of people, including Kat Smith, uh, who is also a member of the school. And her second big research project is part of a collaborative award funded by the Wellcome Trust called Border Crossings, which looks at the relationship between charity and the NHS. Um, and that's something that Rosie Cresswell and I are also involved in, as is Chris Muller, who is going to be joining us um, at the end of the month too. And Chris is also on the call. So Ellen's research um, generally has a focus on public and community roles in healthcare governance, both in Scotland and um, what I guess I can call the wider UK. I hope that's not a politically contentious way of expressing things. Um, and that provides the framework, or at least I think it provides the framework for today's talk, which, as I said, is on fugitive co-production community practices in Scottish hospitals and why they matter. And Ellen will talk for around 35 minutes at the end of which there will be an opportunity to ask questions. The talk itself will be recorded, um, but I think we normally turn the recording off uh, when the questions start. But I'll be correct, I can, someone can correct me if I got that wrong. And with that, um, over to you, Ellen. Thank you very much, Bernard, and thank you, Beth, for the invitation. It is strange timing. I'd like to confirm that my contract is signed and you can't a renege on the offer of employment if this goes very badly. Um, so, the question orienting presentation today is really quite a simple one. It, it's just how can we achieve co production in public services? And this is a question that we hear asked commonly across lots of both academic literature and practitioner discussions. I think a kind of key element of today's presentation is going to be suggesting that maybe in order to answer that question effectively, we need to unpick who the we is a little bit more here, and particularly to focus on questions around initiation of co-production and co-productive practices and questions of power between the different groups involved. So I'm presenting a paper um, that I wrote advancing a concept of fugitive co-production, which was published in this month's issue of Social Policy and Administration, the journal. And today's presentation, I'm going to share some of the contextual background to co-production as a concept, nod to Scottish Co-Production Week, which we find ourselves in the middle of, uh, inadvertently, unless Beth is a much better planner than she suggested when we first talked about dates give you some background to the research project and then share three examples of community practices that I encountered in my fieldwork that provoked me into kind of framing this concept in this way. So I'm really looking forward to some discussion about this due to COVID. This, is, this paper has had a kind of solitary genesis much more so than usually. So it's going to be really nice to have an opportunity to discuss it with other people. So co-production is a concept that speaks across multiple academic disciplines, often in kind of awkward parallel, and also across communities of practice in the real world, as it were. And I think that's testament to its attractiveness, but also its capacity to have traction across lots of different contexts. It's a concept that's presented with some really grand aspirations and expectations, including solving the legitimacy crisis of the contemporary state, 
developing more person-centered holistic public services and also saving the state money um, some of which sound like they may be too good to be true. In what I think is quite an important article published last year around co-production within healthcare research, Ollie Williams and some colleagues coined the term cobiquity for the idea that we increasingly find the language of co-production everywhere. And they argue that this apparent appetite for participatory practice has promoted a conflation of meanings and practices from different collaborative traditions. And then they express frustration that in a sense, it seems to be nowhere, that the ethical and political features of co-production have tended to get diluted or lost altogether. And those political and ethical features stem from its orientation in 1970s research um, and practice on community organising, particularly the work of Eleanor Ostrom. So this quote is from something of a consensus statement published in 1981 by a group of colleagues, including Ostrom, in which they define co-production simply as the mix of activities that both public services and agents contribute to the provision of public services. Since then, we've seen a real acceleration in, in the literature um, around co-production, but also an increasing frustration, I think. So this piece published in Public Management um, by Branson and Honig in 2016, argues that the cumulative effect of past research remains relatively weak. Although scholars inspire each other, they've not been able to link their findings systematically and methods other than case studies are still rarely used. They would not approve of this presentation, I think. And Nabatti et al, writing in 2017, identified significant definitional ambiguity and a growing bandwagon effect. So people describing what they're doing as co-production without necessarily engaging um, in its orienting devices. So there's this strong trend emerging in especially US oriented literature in which we want to operationalize co-production both for academic categorization um, especially quantitative analysis to open up potential for even randomization in studies, a real pushback against qualitative contextual case study work, and also for practitioners to be able to do it. So there's this sense that these richly described qualitative case studies aren't advancing our knowledge. So one solution to this offered in the Nabachi et al. Um, article is this kind of useful three by four matrix, which they have used to map the community target so in the columns, individual group or collective, so at population level, and then also the stage of the policy making process. And in a bid to be really practical and useful, they give examples um, within each. So an example of group co-design would be school officials and teachers work with a group of parents who have children with special needs to design educational activities based on parental experience and best practice. Or at the collective level, in co-assessment, which I think we would often think about as co-evaluation here, a local parks department works with citizens to assess the safety and quality of bicycle routes throughout the community. And while tables like this have a lot of analytic purchase, I think, the practices that I encountered in my fieldwork, which felt to me to be very grounded in um, the tenets of co-production, confounded these sorts of typologies in a number of ways. So to ground ourselves back in Scotland, um, I think we can safely describe co-production as a dominant policy discourse in Scotland since devolution with significant acceleration since the SNP's first administration. So the Christie Commission now over a decade old listed empowered individuals as, and communities as one of the four orienting principles around which they felt public services should be renewed and developed. And then two years later in 2013, we see this joint publication um, between academic researchers, voluntary organizations and the Joint Improvement Team, a Scottish government organization, identifying a golden thread of co-production and community capacity running through recent policy and legislation. So rhetorically, at any rate, it clearly is um, evident within Scottish policy. Co-production Week Scotland is now an annual event in which they bring together people and organizations to share their experiences of co-production practice for mutual learning and support. And this Scottish Co-Production Week um, 
Scottish Co-Production Network has produced a short video or animation called What is Co-Production? And I apologise for sharing stills. I really felt that trying to stream a video um, while sharing would test both my own technical capabilities, but especially my Wi-Fi's bandwidth. So I've used stills here. And, and this definitional work is that professionals and decision makers find ways to work with people and communities, not just to influence how decisions are made, but to have a say in what's needed, how it's developed and how it can be delivered. And this framing clearly targets an audience of other professionals and decision makers and also very much positions them as the first movers, as the key agents of co-production in Scotland. But what if, as I asked in the abstract for this presentation, communities simply don't wait to be asked? So the research that I'm talking about today is a paper based on my chief scientist office postdoctoral fellowship, which I held from 2015 onwards. And it's a paper that I didn't really expect to write. The research project was about how health boards in Scotland involve and engage members of the public when they're looking to make contentious changes to health services. And that in Scotland usually means closing hospitals or sometimes downgrading hospitals. So the removal of key services such as minor injuries or accident and emergency. I conducted four case studies in total of hospitals in Scotland that were at the time or recently had been under threat of closure or downgrade. And my methods included observation of events and campaign events, interviews with members of the public, with NHS staff, with politicians and journalists, and analysis of documents that was being generated locally. And I sought in all of this to understand the closure process in its context, both the context of the communities these hospitals were located within and also temporal context. So the service change process decreed in Scottish legislation puts a kind of artificial project boundaries around something. But these hospitals often have much longer histories of attempts at closures and there's temporary closure reopening. Um, and I wanted to understand these community contexts over the longer term. The paper I'm talking about today um, focused on only three of the four case studies. And I spent quite a lot of time on case selection for this fellowship by um, looking to kind of maximize difference between the case studies I looked at. So case study one was the closure of two rural community hospitals in a fairly remote part of the Highlands and the reprovision of a new hospital at a town geographically located in between the other two. Case study two was initially the downgrade, but subsequently the closure of a community hospital in a commuter belt village, so very much kind of semi-urban setting. And then case study three was the proposed closure of an inner city hospital, which had a specialist unit for rehabilitation. And the nature of this fieldwork hanging around these communities for a period of months, like a bad smell, revealed some really interesting practices about changing hospitals, community work happening around these hospitals that seem to be under the radar of the relevant health board officials. So I'm gonna describe um, an example from each of my case studies before going on to think about um, what that might mean for a conceptual framing of fugitive co-production. So in case study one, I encountered a therapeutic gardening project happening in and around the community hospital. So this was a hospital where the closure had already been agreed and everyone knew that the hospital was closing in the longer term. Meanwhile, a group of local people set up a gardening project that started in the grounds of the hospital, like many historic hospitals, it had really lovely grounds that had kind of fallen into disrepair because the NHS wasn't um, able to take care of them. And it was initiated from outside the NHS. So as the first quote shows um, or suggests, a local councillor approached someone who had moved to the area and who um, was known to be interested in therapeutic gardening and said, there's this patio area, it's fallen into disrepair, maybe we could do something around it. So they set up a group of volunteers, just through word of mouth, had a couple of interested people. And then they, at that point, formally asked the NHS for permission to use the patio area. But in the description of my interviewees, um, over time, the project changed and it became much more integrated into the hospital. 
So like as NHS policy changes and, and um, people are discharged from hospital much more quickly, the population of inpatients who were still in this hospital tended to be um, comparatively less well, less able to come out and enjoy the gardens. So the volunteers started taking materials into the wards once a week and they would do garden related activities in the bed with people who were unable to, um, to come out into the gardens. But they also used it as an opportunity to talk to people about their gardens at home and talk about the seasons. And that was seen by the nurses as a really helpful way to support people starting to think about being discharged home, but who were nervous about it. So remembering things that they've taken pleasure in around their homes. And then over time, the project also decided that it would be really good to be able to enable inpatients to come out into the garden too. So they applied for planning permission. This is the community group, not the hospital, to get a ramped area built down from the ward to the summer house where they did their activities. They got permission from the hospital to put a disabled toilet inside. And, and over time, I have a kind of um, mental image of like an octopus's tentacles just um, spreading through the hospital and doing really nice things all the time, knowing that this hospital was closing. So there's some really um, evocative quotes in the interviews about the way that they designed things so that they could be moved somewhere else because they knew this wasn't going to endure over the long time, over the long term. This too is another odd one where a community group fundraised and actually built an extension onto the hospital to enable them to run a volunteer-led daycare service for older people within the community. So again, the initiation of this was outside the health board, although a local GP was involved. So this was a local GP who was very much a community member and um, very involved in the local community and who felt there was a dearth of daycare provision for older people locally. So she approached the Friends of the Hospital group and they worked together to come up with this idea. And they were told by the NHS, this is by the health board, that there was no way they would be allowed to do daycare. So this was prior to health and social care integration in Scotland in, in the 2010s. And they were told it doesn't fit with the NHS normal thing. You would have daycare in a social setting, not in a medical setting. There was some real um, discomfort from the NHS about the idea of bringing older people into the hospital setting, even if just for daycare. But the community group were um, undaunted and they fundraised a really quite exceptional amount of money. So this was a friend of the hospital group that had um, a long history and strong connections locally. And they talked about legacy fundraising, collections at funerals, and also they had a big annual fundraising um, fair every summer. And it was noticeable in interviews that this community group understand, understood their bank balance as not just a resource that they could use to do things that they felt were important, but also as kind of a marker of clout, which they felt was helpful in negotiations with the health board, who weren't always um, on board. So they fundraised this extension, this day room, as it was called, um, for this historical community hospital. And they ran this service, which was very well regarded. So um, locally, by people I interviewed, that is. So it was a lot of carers of older parents were involved in actually volunteering within it. And the GPs oversaw it from a clinical point of view and the local authority put some funding into it. But the, part, the partnership working that they described was, I felt, very similar to a lot of things that we would see health boards and local authorities trying to achieve now. But this has been done long before the advent of integration, um, purely informally with um, local volunteers, seen as, as this interviewee who was a volunteer said, equal partners in this holistic approach to dealing with elderly and frail people locally. So again, this wasn't a project that endured. By the time I was doing the research, the day room was sitting there, um, little used, and it had moved back into a social setting. Um, and the, that had been driven mostly by a change in personnel, by some key people leaving the area. So case study three was quite different from these two other hospitals, not least because there was no friends of the hospital group. So this was an urban hospital that specialised in rehabilitation um, 
and provided a lot of outpatient clinics uh, to support people living with various conditions or recovering from falls and injuries. And a group of people with, it, with a single condition who had been using the hospital kind of gathered together and set up a, a monthly peer support group and they used a day room at the hospital. So these um, day rooms come up a lot in this research. <clears throat> They're not something that I think many hospital designers would put into a hospital nowadays, but they seem to be a real um, mobilizer of community action. So they um, got together and had this peer support group. They brought in their own refreshments. They used the space. It wasn't nurse led in any sense. It was very peer led. Um, and they decided what would be helpful to talk about. Carers brought along um, people who weren't able to come on their own and it was a real source of support. And interviewees made clear that this um, non-NHS support group held on the premise of the hospital was for them very much intertwined with their experience of the care that they did receive as outpatients at the hospital. And this interviewee said, people say they just feel so much part of it. It gave um, this group of patients a real sense of a stake in the hospital. So when the health board then decided this hospital was surplus to requirements, outdated, needed too much renovation, for example, the health board started trying to engage and consult with um, groups using the hotel, with the, the hospital and key stakeholders. And this patient support group took an unusual stance of refusing to engage with the health board consultation at all. They didn't feel it was in good faith. As they said to me repeatedly, they felt it was just all about the money. And so they, as they described it, went the political route and they bypassed the health board entirely, went straight to their elected representatives. And there were some really interesting narratives of them kind of being quite strategic and approaching different political parties and thinking about which political party would give them the greatest leverage in supporting their campaign. One of the health board managers in the second quote described this as an interesting tactic, and it clearly discombobulated um, the health board managers whose job was to try and demonstrate to the Scottish government that they had adequately engaged and involved the community. And I felt over time studying the media coverage, the political coverage of this closure battle as it became that the patient campaign group were to some extent reframing the hospital. So this was not a specialist hospital. It wasn't a specialist clinic within a hospital. Um, but the online petitions, many comments referred to it as such. Interviewees who weren't part of this patient group said, oh yeah, that's a hospital for such and such now, isn't it? And even in the parliamentary debate about this hospital closure, it was referred to as a specialist unit for this condition. But the NHS denied that vehemently. Um, and in one of my interviews with a, a different health board manager, they got really quite cross with my questions about this particular patient group. And they said, why aren't you asking me about falls patients, i.e. people rehabilitating from falls? That support group were just like any other patient group at the hospital. And there was a real sense that they had um, redefined the terms of the debate and made it very hard for the health board to manoeuvre. So based on these practices that kept coming back to me as I worked through data analysis and I wrote up other paper from the papers from the fellowship, I just I, um, I kept worrying away at these examples of community practices that I was struggling to fit in. So I came up with this definition of fugitive co-production. So informal, unsanctioned cooperative practices between communities, patient groups and local staff because <clears throat> it wasn't that it didn't involve NHS staff, it just wasn't sanctioned at health board level, which are productive of particular forms of valued care. And we can, we can map this on to conventional definitions of co-production. So this is an Abachi three by four table again. And I think um, all the practices that I've described, all the examples just now would fit in the wee yellow box there. But that yellow box, while helping us to compare these to other practices, also obscures and fails to allow us to talk about some other things that seem to me important and significant about these projects. And I love a table as much as the next academic, but we have to recognize what we might lose when we force complex social phenomena into tables because it help, makes it easier for us to categorize. So thinking about kind of core 
elements of a concept of fugitive co-production and I suspect this is a fuzzy set um, given my difficulties in framing it but here we go anyway. Firstly, all of these practices were informal. They had a degree of serendipity about them, which I think marks them out from more conventional descriptions of projects of co-production. They were not strategic. They often, a lot of the narratives of how they form depended on people bumping into each other in uh, the supermarket or somebody's mum was taken ill and so they got talking to the GP over her bed in the hospital, for example. So there's an informality to their genesis and an informality to um, the way that they continue to evolve gradually, incrementally over time. They're fundamentally productive and an awful lot of co-production projects um, end up resembling a steering group or a planning group. Even more interactive co-design processes that are really in vogue at the moment tend to be oriented around discussing and opinion forming around what should be done. And these projects overwhelmingly just got on and did things for better or worse. There was very little patience with um, prolonged periods of planning or discussion. They tended to see a perceived need and then um, seek to meet it. And I think the motivation to be part of it was integrally bound up in that that getting on and doing things. And they were unsanctioned, by which I don't mean they were um, illegal or um, breaking rules, although they often skirted regulations in terms, for example, of what you could use charitable funds to pay for in the NHS. But fundamentally, they weren't invited and they didn't wait for permission. Sometimes they needed to ask for it, but that wasn't... Um, deterministic of whether something would go ahead or not. They were grounded in a really strong local sense of ownership and therefore right to make decisions. In all of this though, um, and while I had a lot of affection and respect for these projects, which I thought were doing some really special work, um, I think it's important not to fall into the trap of romanticizing or, or having very rose tinted glasses about this. So in 2012, Peter Matthews and Annette Hastings published um, an evidence review around middle class activism in public services. And there's some pretty robust evidence that um, the sharp elbowed middle classes, while they may do a lot of good in communities, also can facilitate capture of the state's resources. And this came up a lot. So the community resources around these fugitive co-production projects were significant. The friends of the hospital committees tended to be wealthy. There tended to be surplus wealth in a community. You have to have a particular kind of level of wealth for legacy fundraising to be um, an effective mode of, um, of funding something. They also had time, and that was driven by two key social groups in these communi uh, communities. So healthy, retired people, um, people who were retired but still able to do quite a lot, and also um, families where one partner is, was at home with the kids or had been at home with the kids. Um, so that created a real resource of people with spare time. Professional skills, so retired accountants are invaluable, it appears, when you're running a friends with the hospital group and trying to get things done. And also connections, social capital was deeply imbued in all of those, um, in all of those projects. And when I spoke to NHS managers about these projects, their concerns around them, their sometimes antipathy towards them, was grounded in concerns about inequality and about nimbyism, so not out of my backyardism, this ability of particular communities to advocate to keep facilities that perhaps um, would not be given to them on a needs-based um, allocation. And there was a real concern about the opportunity cost of ploughing money into um, historical hospitals that perhaps were not needed um, by a clinical definition of need now. And the other services that that meant couldn't be provided to communities who might need them more. Case three here is my kind of outlier when I think about equity um, within these processes. So case study three was a very close knit community with a strong identity, both geographically and around the hospital. This was their hospital, but it did not have a friends of the hospital group. Um, few more modern hospitals do in my experience. 
and they didn't have many of the resources listed above within the community. Many of them were very unwell. If they were retired, it was often due to ill health and there wasn't a great deal of professional retired professionals living locally. And so in that context, I think their choice or decision to pursue these outsider tactics, to go that political route, for me, is an alternative route of fugitive co-production. They were still defending and trying to build and create the services they wanted locally, and yet they took this alternative route to get there. So I'm trying to end on a practical note because there is clearly massive appetite for practitioners to, um, to have advice and, and um, steps that they can follow to do this work. Um, and it's great that um, this approach to doing services with rather than to communities is um, so popular. One of our Strathclyde colleagues, Alka Loeffler, um, writes about the outside in pathway for co-production, which she says is much less common in her experience internationally. And that's where public service organizations map what service users and communities are already doing and build on this rather than public sector organizations inviting communities in to their existing modes of governance. And so I think, I think that really resonates with um, a potential response from the state to the fugitive co-production practices that I've outlined here. And if we wanted to build on that, some of the um, learning points that I think came from my research are here. So the first is simply that we achieve co-production not by starting from scratch. I don't think this is something that public sector organisations should be planning um, on a blank page in their offices. Rather, it's about looking for existing community capacity. So these kinds of projects are often happening in the interstices. They may not be written up very clearly. They certainly won't be evaluated very formally, but they are indicators of potentially unmet need, but also certainly of um, energy and enthusiasm within a community which can be worked with rather than against. Another is to minimise formality, and this is a difficult one because obviously if public money is involved, a degree of formality is required in order to, um, for audit purposes, to account for public funds. But in the examples where I saw public officials coming in to try and work with these groups to um, get a bit of extra funding to expand, maybe to scale a project, it often alienated the people who were getting stuff done because it required things like needs assessment. Suddenly questions were being asked about where's the equality impact assessment for this work? And those sorts of things often um, make the people who get things done uh, run for the hills. And finally, and this was something that I saw very clearly when it came to conflicts over the future of a hospital, Officials have to be less defensive or try to be less defensive when encountering these groups because community groups are almost overwhelmingly mobilized by something they want to change or something that they think should be different. And that can um, bring them into conflict with managers in ways that can be really counterproductive. But in, I saw one example where um, a health board very much tried to work with the grain of the existing community groups around hospitals and another where they tried very hard to overcome them. And I think it's a difficult battle to win, but also one that will absorb an awful lot of energy. So I think what these are is not a to-do list or a um, set of action points for uh, a flowchart, but is much more a kind of fundamental shift in modality of governing and way of being. Um, in collaborative work than an awful lot of contemporary co-production discourse suggests. So I will leave it there. There are references for anybody who would like them. Um, and I'm really looking forward to some discussion about this. <laughs>